In 2011, the AFL put its boldest expansion plan to date into action by establishing the Gold Coast Suns as the 17th team in the competition, followed closely by the Greater Western Sydney Giants the year after. The aim of this expansion was naturally to try and grow the game of Australian rules football in traditional rugby states, by ambitiously giving Queensland and New South Wales their second AFL team each. Now to date, both of these clubs have endured very different pathways in their short AFL history. The Giants managed to qualify for finals in just their fifth season in the league, before playing in the grand final in 2019. By contrast, the Gold Coast Suns have never managed to finish higher than 12th on the ladder in their 13 seasons of existence. In this video, we're going to explore how this came to be the case, and decipher some of the reasons behind why the Giants have succeeded more than the Suns up to this moment in time. Before getting into the football elements of why the Giants got such a fast start on the Gold Coast Suns, let's consider the overall backdrop. Firstly, let's consider the strategic location of these expansion clubs and their market potential. The GWS Giants location in Greater Western Sydney provided a relatively fertile ground for growth, boasting a burgeoning population and diverse demographic. This relative demographic advantage translated into a fairly robust fan base and corporate support, which naturally created a strong foundation on which to build the football club. Conversely, the Gold Coast Suns, while situated in an attractive tourist destination, grappled with a smaller local population and transient demographic, which naturally presented obstacles to establishing a loyal supporter base. The Gold Coast history of failed franchises, including the Gold Coast Blaze and Gold Coast United, underscores the challenges in establishing a sustainable sporting presence in the region. While both clubs worked hard to generate community engagement, the Suns in particular faced challenges in forging deep-rooted ties with the transient local population. It's also worth considering the cultural context of each franchise's location, which played a role in shaping their trajectories, with Greater Western Sydney's existing sporting culture providing a fertile ground for the GWS Giants' integration into the community. Conversely, the Gold Coast Suns' less entrenched ties to Australian rules football posed challenges for the Suns in garnering local support and engagement. The Giants' investment in state-of-the-art facilities at Sydney Olympic Park provided players with world-class resources and amenities, enhancing the club's appeal to prospective recruits and fostering a culture of professionalism. By contrast, the Gold Coast Suns encountered some hurdles in securing adequate facilities, which would ultimately hinder their ability to attract top-tier talent and cultivate a high-performance environment. So, now that we've established the backdrop behind which these clubs were established, let's consider the footballing elements that led to their very different fortunes. Let's start with the initial talent recruited by both of these clubs as they were established. GWS's acquisitions such as Phil Davis, Callan Ward and Tom Scully underscored a long-term vision aimed at building a sustainable competitive advantage. While they did secure their fair share of their own veterans such as Dean Brogan, Chad Corns and Luke Power, the Giants seemingly did a better job than the Suns of recruiting players with plenty of their best football still in front of them. Two of their initial young signings became co-captains, while they continued to add seasoned veterans to mature their list in the seasons that ensued. Gold Coast, on the other hand, concentrated their efforts on securing a major marquee signing in Gary Ablett Jr., which, while impactful in the short term, did not provide the same foundation for long-term success. The mature players they picked up, which included names like Jared Brennan, Michael Riscatelli, and Jared Harbrow, did not have the same lasting impact at the club that their Giants counterparts did. Part of both clubs' list build was their ability to pre-list talented youth who were a year out from being eligible for the draft. GWS capitalised on a stroke of luck with the original pre-listed players, which included Jeremy Cameron, Adam Trelaw, and Dylan Shiel, and they joined the club as 17-year-olds, bolstering their talent pool from the outset. The Suns, in contrast, lacked players of a similar talent level in their initial intake, placing them at a disadvantage in talent acquisition and development. Now, how much of this is down to bad luck, or perhaps down to poor talent development? It's hard to quantify, and something we may never truly know the answer to. It is also important to note that the Giants also fared a lot better when it came to the two clubs' respective first drafts. GWS's inaugural draft selections featured such players as Stephen Canelio, Toby Green, Taylor Adams, Nick Haynes and Devin Smith. This, in addition to the more talented batch of pre-listed talents, laid the groundwork for a more competitive roster. Hey guys, I hope you're enjoying the video, but I just wanted to let you know that this video is brought to you proudly in a paid partnership with BetterHelp. Looking after your mental health is important. It's a topic I've sort of broached a little bit on the channel, particularly on the podcast. And that's why I'm stoked to be able to connect you with a platform like BetterHelp 
who connects you with a credential therapist who is trained to listen and give helpful, unbiased advice. Connecting with a therapist through a platform like BetterHelp is great because it's really convenient. You can set up your sessions via a phone call, messaging if that's what you prefer, video chat, but it also overcomes one of those other tricky things about starting therapy, which can be whether the right therapist for you even lives in your area. What I like about BetterHelp service is that they make a therapy more accessible, more easy, and if you are interested in getting this process started, you can simply visit Visit the link in the description of this video or in the pinned comment or go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy and it's important to note if you are matched with a therapist that you don't think is the right fit for you you can switch to another one at no additional cost so many of us find it easier to spend time in the gym working on our physical health but don't apply the same application to our mental health so if you are considering therapy consider better help and like i said you can click the link in the description or go to betterhelp.com forward slash true footy clicking that link does help support the channel but it also gets you 10 percent off your first month at BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. Thanks guys, let's get back to the video. The Suns on the other hand faced challenges with their initial draft and while they did produce eventual stars like Dion Prestia and Tom Lynch, their initial draft hall proved to be far less talented by contrast. It's also worth noting here that the Giants were afforded some extra draft concessions that the Gold Coast Suns didn't see in their expansion year. This came by way of a mini draft in which the Giants could trade the rights to underage players such as Jager O'Meara and Jesse Hogan to other clubs and acquire more draft assets. This allowed the Giants to hold the first five selections of the 2012 draft, as opposed to the Suns who held three of the first five the year previous. So we've established so far that the Giants had a leg up in multiple aspects of their own establishment. Their market potential was stronger, their facilities were better, their recruitment policy fared better, and they drafted better, albeit with the help of some extra concessions. Let's discuss what ensued from a list management perspective at both clubs. There is no doubt both franchises have grappled with player retention challenges, although undoubtedly the Giants have been more resilient to this player turnover, thanks to their deeper pool of talent. Star talents such as Jeremy Cameron, Dylan Scheel, Taylor Adams, Adam Trelaw, and their prize number one pick, Tom Boyd, all walked out the door to rival clubs, but the Giants remained competitive throughout these events. One notable difference in the Giants dealing for these players, in contrast to Gold Coast, was their ability to get established players in return, with Heath Shaw and Ryan Griffin being key examples. Once again though, this is a product of them having a strong and competitive foundation of talent. In contrast to the Giants, the Suns have really struggled as a result of their bad player retention, perhaps due to the fact that some of the players that have left have been crucial players. Gary Ablett Jr. would eventually leave the club to return to his beloved Cats, but the exits of Tom Lynch, Stephen May, Dion Prestia, and Jager O'Meara in a relatively short space of time would rip the heart out of the football club, leaving a crater in the list that would take a very long time to rectify. Diagnosing the issues behind both clubs retention issues is a little bit tricky. In both instances, you look and see almost an oversupply of young talented footballers at a similar age trying to fit into the same best 22, and it is understandable that this led to players looking around for better offers at clubs back in their home state. The key difference between the two however, is that the Giants were able to withstand the losses of these players a lot better. On-field success is also a factor here, with the Giants qualifying for finals as early as 2016, while the Suns to this day have never finished higher than 12th. It would be hard to blame young Gold Coast players over the last five years for having doubts in the direction of their football club. So, in this video so far we've covered the conditions that both clubs entered the league in, the nature of their fan bases, the quality of their facilities, and their overall list management. But in my mind, while it's helpful to consider the non-footballing elements in this analysis, I have little doubt that the two key differences between the clubs that saw the Giants swim and the Suns sink initially were the quality of facilities as well as the original foundation of talent on the list, which would have a long lasting impact on the trajectory of these clubs. An interesting question to ponder, as the league signals its intent to expand the league to a 19 team competition when Tasmania join, is what they will do differently this time. What lessons will they have gleaned from their last two expansions? From my perspective, there will need to be a key focus on developing Tasmanian grassroots talent, which already seems to be in effect, as well as quality facilities to ensure a high performance culture. I also expect to see different concessions for the new Tassie team, one that leans more to getting a team playing competitive football as quickly as possible. So before we finish off this video, I feel it's good to end it off on a good note. Thankfully, both of these two expansion clubs look to be in relatively good shape as we approach the 2024 season. The Giants in particular got within one point of a grand final last year under new coach Adam Kingsley and are expected to be in contention for the flag this year by many. 
The Suns, to my eye, are in the best position from a list talent point of view that they have been in some time, with young stars like Noah Anderson, Ben King, Matthew Rao, and more expected to take their games to the next level in 2024. It also helps that they are now coached by a modern day legend in Damien Hardwick, and I think we can expect a real change in the culture of that football club. When you also consider how much local talent has developed in recent years thanks to the Northern Academies, better days of retention may also be on the horizon for these two clubs.